as well. <laughs> right, are we on? Order, order. And can I welcome the Cabinet Secretary and the Permanent Secretary from the, uh, the Cabinet Office uh, to this session on the work of the Cabinet Secretary and of the Cabinet Office. Can I just ask you to confirm your identities for the record, please? Yes, I'm Mark Sedwell. I'm the Cabinet Secretary. John Mantoni, uh, the Chief Executive of the Civil Service and the Cabinet Office Permanent Secretary. Right, well, we'll, we'll ask our questions as crisply as possible, and if we can keep the answers short as well, um, uh, we'll get through it. Thank you for being with us. Um, so first of all, I've got some questions around the operation of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, um, which we reported on at the beginning of this year. Um, and I've seen nothing to suggest that a dot or comma of that report uh, was not correct. Uh, and we took very careful advice from a very large number of sources about uh, the consequences of that act. Um, so, Cabinet Secretary, what do you see as the role and responsibility of the Cabinet Secretary if the House clearly expresses no confidence in the government? Um, government of course, continuity of government is an important constitutional principle. So, even if, a ha even if the House has expressed no confidence in the government, the government continues until an alternative government is formed, either within the 14 days or um, uh, through a general election. The role of the Cabinet Secretary is uh, as the principal advisor on constitutional matters of this kind to the Prime Minister and the Cabinet, uh, and obviously that advice would be given to them in, um, uh, uh, in the national interest. Um, if the, um, um, the, the Fixed Term Parliament Act removed the Prime Minister's ability to advise the Sovereign to dissolve the Parliament, um, how has that affected the role of the Cabinet Secretary and the Civil Service in general following a vote of no confidence? I think um, on a vote of no confidence, I don't think it's affected us directly because, in a sense, um, what it's done is put some procedure into the, I mean, as you set out, essentially put some procedure and timelines into what might have happened anyway after a vote of no confidence. It was always possible that um, an alternative government might be formed. That's what happened when Baldwin lost one in 23 or you, it might be possible to go for a general election, which is what happened in 1979, and of course they were at different phases of the parliament. What the FTPA does is essentially put some statutory procedure in that, the 14 days, etc. But fundamentally, the, the, the decision in those circumstances as to whether to, uh, uh, whether to resign and recommend the sovereign um, send for an alternative, or whether to um, uh, 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 see whether the government can reconstruct a majority within the 14 days or um, uh, to allow the 14 day period to time out and uh, an election take place remains the initiative remains with the Prime Minister the role of the Cabinet Secretary is to advise the Prime Minister um, in those circumstances um, During our inquiry it was made very clear to us that the people behind the drafting of the Act and indeed the, uh, the Minister who put the Act through Parliament uh, at that time, were very clear that other forms of confidence motion that do not fit the statutory definition uh, were nevertheless intended to continue to have the same effect. Um, so if there's a, a non-statutory motion of no confidence which does not engage the terms of the Act, what do you understand should happen after that? Um, I think that is uh, unclear. Um, it hasn't happened uh, in, uh, yet in formal terms, although a vote on the Queen's speech, etc., would presumably pass that test if one were applying the traditional uh, conventions. And I think this is one of the areas one would expect to be considered when the Act is reviewed as it's due to be, uh, as it's due to be next year. So essentially, I think we, we uh, touched on this last time I was here, uh, Mr. Chem, that um, essentially a vote of no confidence um, that isn't a statutory vote of no confidence essentially has political effect um, and it's then for the political system to uh, uh, determine what follows from that. Um, the statutory vote of no confidence actually still has political effect but of course there are timelines that, time that, uh, that kick in. Um, so under what circumstances would you actually advise the Prime Minister he has to resign following a no confidence motion? Well, uh, uh, it's a hypothetical, Mr Chairman. You wouldn't expect me to uh, 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 be drawn into it. Um, and, and 
I mean, you know, clearly things would depend on the, the, the circumstances uh, at the time. If a, if a, if a vote, uh, depending on what period of the parliament it is, the scale of that, is the prime minister, does the prime minister believe they can reconstruct a majority and win a subsequent vote of confidence, etc., etc. So it would have to depend on the circumstances at the time, and obviously I'd be very mindful of that in, in providing my advice to the prime minister. Fundamentally, in the end, the prime minister would have to reach the decision in uh, uh, in the in the uh, advice, the recommendation he makes to the sovereign. Um, in the case of um, uh, the prime minister feeling he has to resign, um, then we, we expect, as you have indicated, in order to provide continuity, that it is clear he can give clear advice to the sovereign as, as to whom the sovereign should send for yes. to be prime minister. Um, First of all, what would happen if that wasn't clear or could not be made clear? Well, again, it, the responsibility lies with the Prime Minister to make that recommendation to the Sovereign. Um, there's been no occasion when a Prime Minister has not been able to do so. Uh, and certainly in the modern era, continuity of government has been an important principle. So I think the Cabinet Manual sets this out. Essentially, the Prime Minister's duty is to resign only when they can make such a recommendation. That recommendation um, uh, doesn't have to be uh, a cast iron guarantee that the alternative, the person that he or she is recommending, could command the confidence, but it's the person they consider likeliest to be able to do so. And then that individual would have the opportunity to test that if the sovereign um, uh, uh, invited them to form a government. They don't necessarily have to have kissed hands before they do so. So Alec Douglas Hume in six, 1963 very different circumstances to the modern era, but there's an interesting parallel, um, wanted to test first whether he believed he could command the confidence in those days of the cabinet, because the government had a substantial majority, before accepting the sovereign's commission. Um, in essence, in 2010, um, Gordon Brown could have simply resigned straight after the election, could have said that he believed that David Cameron uh, was likeliest to command confidence, and that would have been an entirely constitutional uh, course of action to follow, but decided with agreement to allow some time for um, the, the uh, Conservative Lib Dem negotiations to go ahead to see whether they could form a government which actually commanded a majority before the Queen sent for Mr Cameron. So again, it's a matter of judgment for the Prime Minister. Um, uh, it's a judgment they exercise in the national interest uh, in their recommendation to the Sovereign, but their responsibility is to be able to make a recommendation to the Sovereign on whom she should invite to form a government. How would you look for um, um, some kind of confirmation that prior to the present Prime Minister resigning that a future Prime Minister could in fact command the confidence of the House? Uh, I think again that would be a political judgment. I mean, Obviously it's more complex in situations where there's a minority government um, than in those where there's a majority, but fundamentally it's a political judgment. Um, that the Prime Minister must exercise with <coughs> advice from me, but no doubt others, um, uh, according to the circumstances in which uh, the incumbent Prime Minister has, has felt it necessary to resign. But given that the House may well be prorogued during such a period, hypothetically, um, the, um, uh, it's not necessary to test that? Uh, no, and indeed, uh, uh, if you think of the uh, appointment of the current Prime Minister, Although it was done at the end of the parliamentary session, um, and although uh, uh, it was, uh, he became Prime Minister of a minority government when, when appointed by the Queen, there was the opportunity, but it wasn't, um, uh, 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 it wasn't proceeded with, to test confidence uh, before the uh, summer recess. But it isn't necessary to have tested confidence, confidence before uh, the Sovereign um, appoints uh, a Prime Minister, and indeed, um, our prime Ministers are, of course, after elections, appointed before they've been to Parliament. So the Sovereign is, in constitutional terms, inferring um, confidence from the election result, but confidence formally is yet to be tested uh, when they go before the House. Thank you. Um, Mr Carroll. On the back of that, if there's a vote of no confidence against the Prime Minister, he's got 14 days but he's not duty-bound to, to do anything during that 14 not, not by law to do anything during that 14 days. So effectively, he could just run the clock down for 14 days. Is that, is that the case? Um, so, uh, I, I think that is, broad, that's, that is correct. So the 14 days is essentially, uh, essentially what happened 
um, in, in sort of pre-FTPA terms is that the election um, has been triggered. There's just a 14-day pause on that trigger, a delay on that trigger, to see whether an alternative government can be formed um, or whether the, the incumbent prime minister can regain the confidence. And, of course, that would depend very much on the political circumstances. But uh, the Act is clear. There doesn't have to be a second vote. Um, it, the, the election will happen unless there's a second vote which has demonstrated positive confidence in Her Majesty's Government, whoever is forming that government at the time. So the 14 days runs, 14 calendar days. Calendar days. 14 calendar days. Yes. But if there's a belief that there could be an alternative government formed, again, the Prime Minister's not bound by law to go to the Queen and say, let's, let's move forward. He could just hang tough for 14 days. Uh, uh, so you, that's right, Mr. Cowan. It's constitutional convention, yeah. um, very much established practice, but it's constitutional convention, not... Um, uh, it isn't set out in the FTPA. Indeed, the FTPA is silent on all of that. And if we get to the 14 days, there's 25 working days before a general election. Um, I mean, obviously, depending on the depending on the time, but it's 14 calendar days, so yes, I mean, obviously you have... I mean, broadly speaking... Um, uh, oh, sorry, I miss, sorry, I misunderstood. Yes, yeah, so 14 calendar days, and then a minimum of 25 working days, mm. but it is for the Prime Minister to set the date uh, of the election, or at least formally to request of um, the sovereign um, the time of dissolution, because the dissolution has to happen 25, wo uh, 25 working days before polling day. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 so that's a minimum period, but it isn't a maximum period. But that, obviously, I'm trying to work out a general election date here. <laughs> 25, minimum 25 working days, but the Prime Minister sets the date. So, the, formally, but, but um, I, I, if, I have, if I just have this wrong, I'll, I'll just clarify it yeah. in, in writing. But formally what happens is the, the legislation says the, the polling day, the general election day, will be 25 working days from dissolution. The date of dissolution follows the 14-day yeah. period, if it's a matter of no confidence. But the request to dissolve is still uh, initiated by the Prime Minister, and the formal request is, of course, is made of the sovereign because the sovereign dissolves parliament. So it doesn't, it's a minimum of 25 days. It isn't a maximum of 25 days. And there might be wash up or whatever it might be before that, uh, before that would happen. One would normally expect that to be the case. Um, yeah, no, I mean, obviously the Fixed Term Parliament Act can be got round, and if we do have an election this year, this will be, I'll have had one every other year, and I haven't even finished what should have been my first term, and we'll be heading for the third. Um, and so I just want to ask a couple of little ones on prorogation. Pro are, you, are you channeling Brenda of Bristol? Uh, yeah, I think we've like. all got a bit of her in us, have we not? Um, yeah, and so just I want to ask a couple about prorogation Please. quickly, and then move on to Perda. I mean, what's gone on does look, well, it's completely unprecedented and it looks, to me, underhand and undemocratic as well. I know you don't do hypotheticals, so I just wondered, uh, on what date was it in August that you were first informed of that plan to parade? Um, I don't recall exactly, but I was, uh, as you'll have seen from the uh, documents that we disclosed to the, uh, to the, in the various court cases, there is a submission from one of the Prime Minister's advisers proposing that course of action and I was copied on that, uh, on that submission. I was actually on leave at the time but I was uh, reading, my, reading my papers uh, every day. So I, I couldn't give you the exact date because, uh, off the top of my head but I think you should presume that I saw that submission either that day or the day yeah, after. Yeah. It was around then, yes. So on, on the day before or the day itself? No. I would have normally, I mean I would have seen that submission either the, the day it, it was submitted into the Prime Minister's box or, or probably possibly the day after. And do you know what time Sir Edward Young, the Queen's private secretary, I don't. knew? I don't. You know, I was abroad. It looked so surreal. The, the, but the, the, the Queen's private secretary would not be privy to the internal consultations within Number 10. So that would, that would only... Any communication with uh, the palace would only happen once the Prime Minister had reached a decision and then he would uh, want to make a request to the palace. So, so, so the palace is not involved in any of the discussions so about this. So they're just this. told they're on their way. Get ready. <laughs> Receive them. I don't, think, I don't think the palace would quite recognise it in those terms, uh, but the, the discussion is essentially a discussion within government, and then once the Prime Minister has made a decision, the request is then made of the Sovereign, and that happens through the usual, the the usual channels. Probably. Well, well uh, in due course, not necessarily. Okay, but you don't know when that was? I don't. Uh, and, and, we, and, we, and, and we have a... There's, a, there's a, again, a very firm convention that we don't comment 
um, uh, in detail at all on uh, communications between uh, the palace and number 10, or indeed you know, particularly between the Queen and the Prime Minister. And do you know why it was that the Cabinet, as we now know, didn't know until the Privy Councillors were travelling up to Belmore? Or what reason might a, that be? I mean, it's very much a political question. I, I, I genuinely don't know um, uh, what other advice the Prime Minister uh, uh, took on that. He has regular conversations with his, uh, with his Cabinet uh, colleagues. But uh, decisions of this kind, including, if you think, in the past, before the Fixed-Term Parliament Act, were made by the Prime Minister themselves. And, and uh, usually decisions, for example, to call elections before the Fixed Term Parliament Act were told Cabinet was informed of them on the day that um, the, the Prime Minister would have uh, sought, uh, sought dissolution. And that's been true certainly in the whole of my adult lifetime. These are, these are decisions of the Prime Minister as the, as the Sovereign's principal advisor. Um, not usually for cabinet as a whole. And I guess just the timing bit looks weird in August when you were away, I was away. You know, everyone. Well, was I was, away. I was. Um, um, I, uh, in in the modern era, as cabinet secretary, you're never really away. But um, I wasn't in the office. <laughs> would you say that? Uh, sorry, would leaving the European Union without a deal during a pre-election Herder period? Okay, so now we've had a go shift. Yeah. Would that constitute a breach of convention? Um, there is no precedent that I could, one could draw upon, uh, uh, draw right. upon for that. And again, fundamentally, I think one has to say that's a, that's, that is an absolutely core political matter, and it's for the political system to uh, uh, to address. I think, though, Perda is not really. I mean, the Perda rules are not really designed to um, uh, answer the first order political questions of that kind. They're designed to ensure the proper conduct by government of an election and to ensure that an incumbent government doesn't use the inevitable uh, prestige and resources of being uh, an incumbent government um, inappropriately during an election. So first order political questions of that kind are not really questions that PERDA, is the PERDA rules are designed to address. Yeah, I mean, because again, during the original 24-month negotiation, there was eight weeks off for an election already once. So I think people are suspicious of what might happen if the worst case scenario happens now. What, what would be the effect, would you say, of PERDA on the UK's negotiations with the EU? Well, the PERDA rules allow for essential business to continue, and, and that was true during um, the two earlier elections we had in spring this year when negotiations were continuing. Uh, obviously, we'd have to, do, we'd have to um, uh, handle that with great care, given that this would be one of the central issues of, the, uh, of any uh, election campaign, because we don't yet have an election. Um, and we'd make, I'd need to make a judgment and, again, advise the Prime Minister and the Cabinet um, at, uh, at the time. But there is provision for international negotiations and for essential business to continue where an election called. And, of course, um, we, we don't yet know whether that is to be, that is to be the case. There's, a, there's another um, motion this evening, but um, uh, I, I note, I note um, the result of last week's. It feels like the election campaign has already begun with public money, but I think that's future questions in this brief. Yeah. During the Perda, what access would the opposition parties be given to any developments with Brexit negotiations or progress towards a no deal? Um, so, so during, uh, during an election campaign, of course, we have the, the opposition have access talks. We can provide them with information. I think in these circumstances, we'd have to uh, look very carefully um, at, um, uh, at you know, with, with the government at, the, uh, at, at exactly what um, request the opposition was making. But... There is, a, there is an underlying principle that we are that during an election campaign we seek to prepare alternative governments to be able to assume the reins of office and do so uh, effectively. Um, and um, uh, again, this is a this is a not an, it's, it's essentially an unprecedented situation. Were an election to be called, and I'm, of course I'm slightly breaking my rule by uh, indulging in hypotheticals because an election hasn't been called. Uh, but for example, after the financial crisis, um, uh, Alistair Darling. Uh, kept um, the uh, the uh, shadow chancellor informed, but mm. he still made the decisions, and that was the key thing. There was only one government at a time, and he still made uh, the the decisions of some of the uh, some of the measures he was uh, he was taking. But is that again another convention? Yes, and the Perda rules are uh, advised on by the cabinet secretary, and to some extent policed by me. Um, uh, but again, formally, they are issued. Um, uh, in the name of the uh, of the Prime Minister and the government. Um, you finish your yeah, I'm, I'm just going, Mr. Sedo, you said on August 13th 
The further rules are set out in Chapter 2 of the Cabinet Manual. Let me reassure you that I am ready to ensure their full and proper application. Can you actually, anyway, with good, good wills here, but can you actually guarantee that? Um, yes, the civil, I mean, the, this is essentially, I was, I was really speaking there as the Cabinet Secretary, but also the head of the civil service, and essentially the PERDA rules are, are very largely, as I said, about the conduct of government and its use of resources and its use of the, uh, the powers of incumbency during an election. And uh, there's, we've dealt with this in uh, challenging circumstances before, and I would absolutely um, uh, do my job in this uh, and exercise my responsibilities were that to arise. Eleanor Smith. Oh, sorry, Cheryl Gillard. I'm sorry, I got distracted. I just wanted to ask a simple question. Um, everybody is uh, talking about an election all the time, but the fact is, is that under the, the rules of the Fixed Term Parliament Act, um, the vote has gone against that. That can be actually sustained indefinitely, can't it, until um, the natural end to the life of this government? Uh, that's exactly what I mean. That is essentially the intent of the Fixed Term Parliament Act. It can, um, uh, assuming that uh, Parliament continues to um, operate within its terms, and of course there are alternatives that you will have seen some speculation about. Um, but uh, the Fixed Term Parliament Act sets a fixed term, and it can only be uh, there can only be an early election either in the uh, if there's a vote of no confidence in the circumstances we've discussed, um, or if there's a supermajority for an early election. Likewise, we've seen um, a Prime Minister try to remove the PERDA rules, uh, particularly I'm thinking of the referendum that is the, the subject of uh, such discussions, and, and that, that was defeated in the House. Um, so presumably um, the PERDA rules cannot be removed unless there is legislation. Uh, uh, well, the PERDA rules are, are largely a matter of convention. There, are some, there is some reference, I think, uh, of course the word itself isn't used in law, but there is some reference to that in, uh, uh, in CRAG. Um, uh, but I mean, the PERDA rules are a very long established convention. As I say, they're largely about ensuring that um, an incumbent government isn't able to use the resources of government and the, um, you know, the, the communications capabilities, etc., of government in order to um, disadvantage the uh, opposition during, a, during an election campaign. They, they aren't designed to resolve these first order questions that you're touching upon. Thank you. Um, that was the point that was rattling in my mind. Is that, that these rules are non-statutory, yes. largely non-statutory. Yes, they are. They merely are. a convention. They are. And, and therefore, the courts would not have any lien on these matters. Well, um, uh, if I may, Mr Chairman, uh, uh, I'm not sure I'd use the word merely, because I think conventions are as important as legislation in matters of the Constitution. Um, uh, the Constitution is built on foundations of both law and, and convention. Yes, but there is not but, I, but your second point, that... I mean, of course, it is for the courts to decide where they draw those boundaries, as we're, uh, and of course, we're in the middle of a case that's going to the Supreme Court right now, which is largely about convention, but it is being uh, subject to the judicial process. And so far, the courts have concluded it's non justiciable, but uh, you know, that, that process is yet to be determined. Um, and my, my, I mean, it's a long way of saying I agree that fundamentally conventions are. Uh, a matter for the political system, as I think reports of this committee before have reinforced, rather than uh, a matter for the court. I, I feel suitably admonished. Of course, <laughs> Please. Many of our constitutional conventions are every bit as important as our laws. Indeed. Um, but the flexibility exists that didn't exist in the um, uh, provisions for referendum perda, which led to some anxiety Indeed. in the government that the government couldn't function. But of course the other thing, am I correct, that you will want to do is to protect civil servants from being involved in anything that could be regarded as partial Indeed. to the ele election campaign. Indeed. We, we think that's very important. Too. No, thank you. And, and uh, I, mean, I, I, I have said it before, and I'm at risk of just prolonging the proceedings at just a moment, I do want to put on record yet again my appreciation on behalf of the whole of the civil service, actually the wider public service, for this committee's strong support every time we've addressed it for those underlying values of impartiality and service to, to the later. citizen that um, you've always given us, and we, we do appreciate it. Um, very quickly, Rupa, you've got nothing? Yeah, no, just on a related thing. I mean, the Civil Service Code says civil servants can't break the law, but if the, um, the Ben Bill is ignored and the anti-no uh, deal stuff is ignored, civil servants then could be in that conflict of interest, or that conflict of loyalty, where they could be within their rights to refuse working with the Tory government to, to 
enforce an illegal no-deal Brexit. What would you do in that circumstance? Well, I think that is, with respect, piling a series of hypotheses together. Um, every minister who's been asked about this has said the government will comply with the law, uh, including some of the most senior members of the government over the weekend. Mixed messages coming out. Well, of that, that I don't. I'm not going to. You would. You would understand as cabinet secretary. I mean, I'm as interested in reading unattributable briefings and press speculation as anyone else because I'm a political junkie. It's part of the job, uh, uh, or part of the attributes to the job. But as cabinet secretary, I'm quite clear. I don't make my decisions or comment on those things in um, formal hearings of, of parliamentary committees. Every minister who's been asked about this has been clear that the government will comply with the law. Um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the key deadline in that is uh, six weeks away. There's a, there are many steps between now and then. The government is engaged in seeking to negotiate a new deal. PM has been in Dublin this morning, as you'll have seen. His Sherpa is, um, has been in Brussels last week and is in Brussels again this week. So I think we should just take these things step by step. But you know, the government has said, they, the ministers have said they'll comply with the law, and of course civil servants always comply with the law. Indeed, it sets the framework by which we operate. So you're not going to instruct people to break the civil service code? Of course not, and nor would it, well, uh, it would be completely uh, inappropriate to do so, nor do I need to instruct people to observe the civil service code. So it's, it's in our out. DNA. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's come under about the impartiality, which we touched on a bit. Um, under the previous administration, there was complaints uh, for ministers that officials were not given impartial serve advice. Um, what impacts have these complaints had on the perception of the civil servants' impartiality? Um, I know you have made that complaint to me that, I'm, uh, that, I, that I can recall or I'm aware of. I mean, I, I, there again, may have been some unattributed comments, but I've never heard that. And indeed, we had strong support from ministers for it. If I can put it this way, and this is a real summary, I think, uh, and I hope John would agree with me, of our attitude, we, we owe ministers two things, candour and can-do. You know, candid advice in private, including unwelcome advice um, uh, that may be contesting some of their political instincts based on the evidence. Once they've made a decision, we owe them um, our creativity, our energy and uh, purpose in implementing those decisions within the law, but implementing those decisions once, once taken. So there is that mixture in the civil service DNA, if I can use that, of the candour in private and the can-do attitude in implementation. And I think that's that's how we maintain our um, uh, 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 utility and support to governments. Um, and how do we demonstrate impartiality? We demonstrate impartiality not by me stating it, um, or indeed even by this committee endorsing it, but by the way, by the actions the civil service takes in uh, delivering the agenda for governments of, of all complexions. Mm, that, that ties in very well into my second one, which is about the civil service needs to demonstrate um, a commitment to working on behalf of the government of the day and while speaking the truth to power where there are significant concerns about the practicality of implementing policies how do officials manage this tension without undermining uh, ministers confidence in them it's uh, it, it, i mean in some ways it is the it is the key um, uh, attribute of a really good policy official um, of course one has to speak truth to power, but it's only really effective if you speak in a way that power is actually paying attention when you do so. It's no good just indulging yourself. And so um, and that's, that is the skill of the experienced um, uh, policy official, is they, can, is they do that. So they remain absolutely true to our need to uh, provide uh, evidence and, uh, and our analysis of uh, whatever policy areas ministers are uh, contemplating all of the risks they might be taking, the resources they might need, but we combine that, we have to combine that with a clear commitment that we will deliver what ministers want, and that's essentially about um, developing uh, trust and confidence between ministers and their key officials. It's in many ways the attribute I look for most if I'm appointing a permanent secretary. So, to what Sorry, recommending the appointment of a permanent secretary before... Uh, the chair gets his own back on me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so what degree are civil servants speaking the truth to power regarding the preparation to a no-deal Brexit? Well, we have, uh, uh, there's been a great deal of work on that. Um, and we uh, have, uh, I mean, essentially the decisions that, that both this government and the last government took on no-deal preparations are based on our assessment, drawing on a lot of evidence from outside of... Uh, what's necessary to ensure that the country as a whole is prepared uh, properly for 
a no-deal Brexit, which of course remains a contingency. Um, uh, until the European Council decides otherwise, we are leaving on the 31st uh, of October. That's the decision in international law. Uh, and there's been, uh, there have been leaks, uh, which, as you know, I, uh, I regret, uh, and uh, I'm doing what I can to uh, prevent. But uh, uh, the civil service has provided ministers with very candid advice on both the country's preparedness and the government's preparations. Okay. Mr. Jones. Yes, and without going into individual cases, um, what mechanisms exist to enable you to establish if an official is acting obstructively uh, or is uh, seeking to act in an impartial way? In a, in a partial way. Impartial way. Uh, not an impartial way. In a partial way. In a partial way. Um, so I would, I mean, I would expect largely that to, to arise um, either through an informal or, poten or potentially even a formal um, uh, a complaint or at least uh, a question from um, the minister or indeed from other civil servants. Civil servants are um, self-policing in this area. And we have lots of conversations, uh, including with our senior teams, about how do we ensure that we are um, instrumentalising our values in the, in the modern era across the whole range of values, not just impartiality. And I would, there are lots of internal checks and balances. But if, if a civil servant were uh, uh, considered to be acting in breach of those values, including the, the requirement to act uh, impartially, then if it were inadvertent, I'd expect that to be a performance matter, maybe informal to start with, just depending on the seriousness of it. If it were deliberate, then it would be a disciplinary matter. Yes, and before we go into that, just, just to revert to the point that you made, that, that there are arrangements that it's understood that other officials will report officials who they suspect of not acting in a manner. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the, there's there's no one... I mean, the civil service self-polices in yes. this area because it's very important to all of us. Essentially, people are team, team players in public service. It's, you know, if you aren't, it's not a great place to pursue your career. And so people are very conscious of, uh, of that and, and, and conscious of the values, particularly when there is a big political focus on it. They, in other times, they might be conscious of other areas of our values. But right now, impartiality, of course, is front and centre in people's minds. So that would be a professional obligation, would it, under, yes. under, under the Civil Service Code? Um, uh, I, not an explicit one. I, I mean, I think uh, I mean, there is a professional obligation on all of us to ensure that all of us is operating in accordance with the code and in, in accordance with our values. Um, and I would expect any civil servant who felt that some, uh, another civil servant were, were operating in breach of those values, whether impartiality or the others, any of the others, you know, behaving... Uh, with, uh, uh, you know, without respect, for example, to colleagues uh, and so on, I would expect civil servants to raise that through the channels, through their line management channels. And you touched on it briefly, but what would be the practical consequences for somebody who was discovered not to have been acting in an impartial manner? Well, Mr Jones, I think, as I said, it would depend on the circumstances. If It would depend on the seriousness of it and whether it, whether, um, uh, uh, the, it was inadvertent or deliberate. And if inadvertent and not particularly serious, then it might be a matter of some personal coaching, performance management, etc., depending on where on that scale seemed appropriate. Obviously, if it were deliberate, that would be a significant disciplinary matter. And that could lead potentially to dismissal? Well, any depending on the seriousness, any disciplinary matter can lead through all of the various misconduct um, uh, proceedings. Uh, and of course, at the very most serious end, then dismissal is the, uh, is the most severe sanction. How often does dismissal uh, take place? Is there, is there I mean, very rarely. I, d I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't know. Do you know? Yeah. I mean, a tiny handful a year. We could let the committee know uh, in writing, but it's a very. I mean, it is extremely rare. Yes. If you could give us maybe a note of the practical consequences in certain cases, yeah. obviously without identity. Without identity. attribution, <laughs> of course. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Cheryl Gillen, and then Eleanor briefly. In Cheryl. the commercial world, if I didn't want to work on a particular client, um, I could um, discuss that with my colleagues and I could be removed from that client. Does that mechanism exist within the civil service? Um, um, if a civil servant is finding it particularly challenging because of their own views? Um, uh, yes, but um, not really because of people's own views. It would usually be because they might have some... Uh, either real or perceived conflict. For example, their partner, spouse, is working in the area concerned um, or has a, has a particular... Um, pub, you know, has, has taken a public position on something of that kind. Uh, generally, um, uh, in fact, almost, almost, um, almost always, we would expect civil servants to 
serve the government of the day, um, uh, uh, according, essentially irrespective of their personal views, uh, with equal enthusiasm and loyalty, and if not, then they might not have chosen the right career. And would it be fair to say that um, this is a particularly challenging time for civil servants, but that the civil service ethos is holding fast? In uh, I think the civil service is, ethos is holding fast, absolutely. And I think if you ask, um, for example, we, we now have a new government uh, 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 with quite a large number of new ministers, and I think all have been impressed by um, the, the pace, the application, the candour, the can-do attitude of, uh, of the civil service, particularly those who are encountering it close up for the first time. Of course, this is a high-pressure period. It is for the entire uh, system, but I'm very proud of how the civil service is responding. And just lastly, on a, 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 as a personal inquiry, do you have um, uh, good counselling oh. services available um, to civil servants because the pressure must be absolutely enormous at the moment. Uh, we do, um, although um, uh, it's an area we, we run largely through our human resources function. I don't know if John wanted to add anything, but we are conscious of that uh, uh, of that requirement. And of course, um, uh, uh, I think I think it was the Public Accounts Committee. I forget if I have that wrong, but we were very interested in the whole question of the right procedures for legitimate whistleblowing, which goes back to the values and impartiality uh, question and we've developed uh, those kind of mechanisms within the civil service in order to ensure that there is absolutely no excuse for people to decide that if they're unhappy about something then the recourse is to disclose it um, illegitimately to someone outside the uh, someone out the side of the system. But I think there is always more we can do in this area. John, I don't really want to tell you. Well, to I mean, I think, as you rightly point out, this is a highly stressed time for a group of people. Um, uh, and everybody's different and they deal with those things differently so we have absolutely uh, ramped up, if you like, the uh, availability of those channels for those people who choose to uh, w would like to speak to somebody outside of their line management chain. So we have a speak up campaign that's about to launch and it, it does all of the things for the reasons that you've implied. And they can feel confident that that will not affect their career path. Absolutely. Thank you. There's, a, there's a, one, of, one of the areas we ask about in the staff survey and watch quite carefully is the whole safe to challenge culture. And, and of course that goes to the point you're making, Dame Sharp. Okay. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, okay. I mean, I, I would just add on the end of this, um, I mean, there has been a debate over recent years, particularly um, under the, um, during the David Cameron administration, about whether the system needs to be reformed to give ministers more say over who fills what key roles. Um, it's, and some individuals in the government today have been publicly extremely critical of the concept of the permanent impartial civil service as it as it is today. Um, what kind of debate is going on in government about this at the moment? Um, on that broader question, um, I think uh, I think it would be fair to say bandwidth is relatively limited for issues other than the the immediate issue of Brexit. So we haven't had um, I haven't had a particularly active discussion of that uh, of, of that kind. But I think it really goes back to the earlier point, Mr. Chairman, that several uh, uh, you and several of your colleagues have been have been touching upon. The civil service's best argument for um, uh, retaining the, uh, the the overall structure of the civil service, not you know, not um, 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 avoiding reform and modernisation. We must always be on that agenda. But the basic concepts on which the civil service uh, exists is to demonstrate to every new government and to the wider political system, the benefits of our system. We are, according to this, uh, to an international survey, the world's best civil service. It was up against a whole load of others, the Insize Index. We came out top. Um, I think that is a pretty good indicator. I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not complacent about it because there are various areas we can still improve and learn from others. But we came out top, um, and I think we should take some pride in that. But we, we must always re-earn that um, confidence of governments and of the wider political system and of the public by our candid advice and our can-do attitude to delivery. Uh, since time immemorial, it, it has been possible for ministers to influence the choice of officials going to into particular roles. Yes. And um, um, to some extent, the formalisation and uh, of open recruitment and open, um, open application um, has um, um, 
made that a little bit more difficult than it used to be. Um, so to what extent can you preserve the flexibility so that ministers do finish up with the officials they want to carry out the policies that they need? And there is a little bit of scope for dealing with the inevitable clashes between conflicting personalities without damaging the long-term prospects of someone's career. Uh, I think, I mean, in a sense, Mr Chairman, I think the answer is exactly the way you put the question. We have to operate this. We have to do, remember we're dealing with human beings, we're dealing with personal relationships. It's in no one's interest if uh, personalities don't um, work well together, particularly in a high-pressure environment. We have to do that in accordance with the rules and our, and our underlying values and principles. But there is enough flexibility in the system. It's a very big institution to enable us to uh, operate that that way. And it depends, it, 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 it depends, uh, as you know, according to experience and convention on the nature of the job. It's, it's clearly very important that a minister's private office and the minister have a good relationship. Those are quite high-pressured environments and it's just stressful for everyone if they don't. Uh, and I can think of occasions when we've uh, found that a particular private secretary, for example, hasn't you know, the, the, the personalities just haven't worked, the, the private sector themselves hasn't been happy and therefore performing to their full potential. We've moved them to another job um, with absolutely no um, concern for their career because these are very particular jobs uh, with very particular, uh, very particular uh, uh, requirements. And, of course, we do have the formal pos position now for the most senior appointments that uh, was a reform introduced under the Cameron government that... Uh, permanent secretaries are appointed by the Prime Minister from a shortlist of the uh, candidates con uh, de deemed appointable by a professional panel chaired by the Civil Service Commission. So he, it isn't just choose A. Um, um, the Prime Minister does actually have the choice between appointable candidates, and that was a reform introduced during the Cameron government and David Normanton's time as first Civil Service Commissioner. Sorry, I mean, we need to move on quickly. Very, very, very briefly, you mentioned that you're working with Richard on loyalty, to, and I, I'm not, not questioning you personally. Sorry, sorry. You mentioned about uh, working relationships and loyalty to cabinet seconds. So I'm, I'm not questioning you personally, but I, I'm curious: were you asked to sign a statement for the court proceedings in Scotland and England regarding prorogation? Uh, oh, the witness statement. The witness statement was just produced. I mean, it was signed by the Treasury Solicitor, and I can't think of an occasion in which a Cabinet Secretary has ever been asked to sign uh, a statement uh, of that kind. I'm not sure it would have been appropriate for me to do so. So, where do you ask to sign a statement? No. No. If you were asked in front of the court, you were asked as a single personality, the government. Uh, you were not exactly. Asked as an individual. So, th so, this was a witness statement on behalf of the government. Um, uh, and uh, 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 had attached to it the papers we were disclosing to the, uh, to the court um, uh, in order to meet the duty of candour, or the courts actually, the various courts, in order to meet the duty of candour that we have. Um, and uh, unless one is giving a witness statement in a personal capacity because you're saying, I was at this event and, then you do it on behalf of the government. And that, that was done by the Treasury Solicitor. There was a whole load of um, rather inaccurate speculation about that in the press. Uh, Dr Hubb. Yeah, the integrity and impartiality of our civil service used to be the envy of the world. And, but I think people feel it is... I hope it still is. It still is, but it's <laughs> being tested by an unelected Prime Minister with no majority who is prepared to entertain working around the rule of law. You said the, past, the last one was hypothetical, so here's a real example. On Thursday, these uh, rows of police officers in a Trumpian way that were appearing in what looked like an election stunt, it went way beyond... The recruitment campaign. Um, my colleagues Louise Haig, the shadow policing minister, and Holly Lynch have written to you about this, but they've not had an answer, so they did wonder if I could raise with you um, some of those questions about did, did, the, uh, chief, did the chief constable of the area know that it was going to be that? Were they informed? Um, so I don't know all of the detail, which is why I haven't responded yet. Um, I know there have been some questions around, uh, around that event. I think, actually, my understanding is that, um, that uh, the, the concerns have li largely arisen around the Q&A session rather than the initial statement, but I need to look, at all, of the, I, well, I need to look at all of the... Well, I need to look at all of the details, and I'll obviously, I'll obviously, uh, I'll obviously respond. But the... the of course, that doesn't really that isn't really about the civil services impartiality. They're public servants. That, they are uh, public. Yeah, um, they're public servants, and and 
Um, I'll need, obviously need to consult the Chief Constable, etc., before I before I respond to the. Okay, to well, they've got a series of questions about how many rest days were cancelled because we talk about wasting police time. That's what that looked like. To I know they have, time. and of course, I'm I'm I wouldn't be in a position to answer many of those. I'd have to ask the Chief Constable about those questions, Sorry. and I'll, I'll respond properly. I'll tell them the response is on its way. Yeah, okay. of course. Uh, you would. They will. They can. No, they can. Of course, they can expect to respond. Um, can I just um, add at this point? Uh, the grateful thanks of this committee to every civil servant who has had a very, very trying time uh, in recent years and recent months, and is probably going to get even more trying over the next few weeks and months. Uh, the Parliament is very, very grateful for their public service, and um, uh, they deserve our, our support and admiration for what they do. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I really do appreciate that, and people do. And we, we, when we receive those statements, I often uh, in fact, we invariably pass them on um, in our internal communication. So people do notice it and appreciate it. So thank I'd be you. Grateful. Thank you. Um, Kelvin Hopkins. Um, what is the status of the investigation into leaked official documents which led to Sir Kim Darrock's resignation? Well, unusually, uh, Mr. Hopkins, this is now a police matter. And, uh, 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 and of course, most leak inquiries are internal. Um, but this was sufficiently serious, it crossed the legal threshold, and so uh, this is now a police matter, and they're conducting the investigation. Um, could, you, could you say what impact these leaks have had? Well, well uh, of course, those, that particular leak um, uh, was uh, very serious because, uh, I mean, that's the basis on which it crossed the, the threshold in legislation to involve the police. Leaks generally, of course, are, and we've discussed it before, debilitating. They, they damage trust. Um, uh, there is then always a risk that we close down information sharing and dialogue within government and that means that um, all of those questions you were asking earlier about ensuring uh, that ministers have all of the evidence they need, that there is the opportunity for uh, the robust challenge within the system, uh, it can impede uh, that because if people are unsure about whether a, a skewed account of those conversations is going to make it into the public domain then they will uh, inevitably hold back or they will restrict uh, the conversation. So I, uh, I, I think uh, uh, my view uh, is that leaks are debilitating debilitating to the conduct of good government. Well, mo most importantly, you've touched, you touched on it in a way. Um, have these leaks, w would such leaks cause civil servants to be less frank in their private communications, particularly with ministers, uh, when, if, if they're fearful that, that anything they say might be leaked? Yes, and I think that is just human nature. Um, uh, and, of course, I have also mentioned to the committee before, if um, confidential internal documents are required of government to be brought into the public domain, then, of course, um, in future, um, there will be uh, an, an inevitable incentive, explicit or implicit, for those documents to be written uh, with that in mind. Uh, and what action have you taken to protect the diplomatic service and other civil servants from further leaks of private communication, including through the hacking of emails? Um, so the, 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 I mean, most leaks are not um, hacking. They're just someone who's actually decided to, in fact, I, I can't think of an example, someone who's just decided to um, uh, share um, information uh, in, improperly. Uh, but we do provide guidance to people on the security communications generally. We have um, government uh, encryption uh, around our email systems. People, are, people have guidance on uh, passwords and, uh, and, and, and how they handle the security of that, uh, of that kind. So there are some processes of that kind that we put in place. We try to ensure that people are conscious of the address list that they're sending information to, particularly more classified information. It isn't just sort of sprayed uh, indiscriminately around too wide uh, an audience. And we have the classification system itself with um, the most sensitive material, not just national security material, but international negotiations uh, would be held on a separate secret system or indeed sometimes if it's intelligence related um, on an even more highly, uh, highly protected system. But the underlying issue is about training, education, culture and people uh, working out for themselves um, what is the appropriate balance between sharing information in a way that generates the most efficient and effective policy process, so all the people who need to know know and can contribute, but doing so in a way that protects the underlying information, particularly if it's sensitive. And that, that's a judgment that people have to 
make and we try and offer training, education, coaching, etc., in, in enabling people to do that. It's been reported to us, and it's obviously likely that uh, quite a number of people see emails, even when they are sensitive, um, and that uh, you know the, the, at a lower level, um, the possibility of one or another person leaking is is increased, but because of that, I think it's it's. Um, it's a feature to some extent of the digital era, of course. And when I joined, we didn't have email. Um, uh, things were sent around on paper. Uh, and inevitably, therefore, copy, copy lists were uh, much more uh, restricted just through practicalities, whereas in the email era, much more can be copied. Actually, if you look at big organisations, um, uh, uh, whether military, civilian, private sector, public sector, whatever it is, the broad sharing of information is generally... Um, uh, uh, enables people to do their jobs better because they have they ha they they're making decisions um, with uh, all of the relevant information uh, available to them. So there is a general desire in big organisations to share information more widely to ensure everyone has it available to them, and therefore it's easier then to give people more autonomy because then you know they're making decisions um, with uh, with full knowledge. But of course, in government, there has to be a balance between that and protecting information that might be sensitive whether that's sensitive on national security or international relations grounds, or, of course, domestically politically sensitive because, um, uh, because there, might be there might be information contained uh, uh, therein that is, that is politically controversial. And we're constantly trying to get that balance right. Well, really, on, on that theme, are you satisfied that existing protocols, for example, around access and delegated access to what are termed official sensitive emails, are sufficient? Uh, I think the formal protocols, I, 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 in a sense, the, form, the, the issue is probably less the formal protocols and more the underlying culture and questions. It's not just official sensitive material. Uh, for example, in the immigration system or the, uh, the benefit system or the tax system, we have a great deal of information on individuals that needs to be highly protected because it's about our personal tax records or status and so on. And fundamentally, if people didn't have the right values and culture, um, uh, uh, that information, uh, people, more people than needed could get access to that information, but they don't. Uh, you, you don't we don't see problems uh, of, that, uh, of that kind, and that's partly because there's an underlying professional commitment to, see, to deal with only the information that one should have access to. And it's ensuring that we have that same um, uh, culture of responsibility to information uh, that we need to ensure applies to uh, applies to all information. It did when I joined, uh, because we were in a different era. Um, uh, the digital era has made it more challenging. I think we we are we are striving to try and ensure that uh, it's it's properly um, uh, embedded uh, in in the era in which we now operate. Thank you. Uh, we're going to come to a, a, a connected issue. Yeah. I wanted to talk a bit about special advisors. I mean, that old phrase of Thatcher, advisors, advi uh, in fact, it was, um, sorry, it was her chancellor at the time, wasn't it? No, it was her, and then it was quoted by yes. Lord Fowler, I think, in, in his autobiography. And it also, I remember seeing it on a Brian Walden interview when I was doing politics A-level. I think it was the sacked <laughs> person who said that it became a conflict. Was it Lawson? Anyway, those kind of people used to be shadowy figures nobody had heard of. They were in the background. Whereas Mr Cummings, I think, is a household name, unusually. Um, has he got any sort of special exemptions of what the usual um, special advisors... Because, yeah. Uh, no. Um, and I've served seven prime ministers. Uh, many of them have had some very big personalities as advisors. Um, that, that original phrase was because an advisor, I think Sir Alan Walters, became a very public figure That's right. yes, it was uh, at the time. But I can think of um, advisors, shall we say, during Labour governments who became quite well-known political personalities but, and, and advisors during Conservative. It's, it's a common political feature. He, the rules apply to all of them equally. Okay, so he's had no exemptions as nope. per the Civil Service Code. Is it not special Advisors Code. Uh, within the Civil Service Code? Well, the, spe code, there are the, the Special Advisors Code is, is, is a separate document. So it's okay. just it's a separate document. Because and there are particular rules, obviously, about... Just it's contract. raised eyebrows that he was granted a security pass when he has been found in contempt of Parliament. He's got a pass to hear, he's got a pass well, to... Well, uh, I'm sometimes criticised for having too many responsibilities, but fortunately Parliament uh, and its access is not one of them. OK. Don't... Deft, very... Definitely dodge that one. Um, 
But I mean, I, I think I can imagine I'd be in trouble with the question. speaker if I started to suggest. Why I did. is someone who's been found in contempt of this place allowed free reign of it? Okay. Well, then perhaps a question for someone else. <laughs> okay. Did the recent sacking of the Chancellor of the Exchequer's Special Advisor infringe her civil service employment rights to be marched out of the building at gunpoint by, on the words, of, on the say so, the Special Advisor was not a good look? So Asian that, uh, I think Sir Stephen House, the Deputy Commissioner of the Met, has responded to um, uh, some MPs' correspondence on exactly that matter. I think some of the more um, uh, 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 sort of lurid um, um, descriptions of that in the press. Uh, I think you should refer to his letter on that on the police officers, the police officers' role. Uh, and so, so he's responded to that. And what he said in that, as I, so I was going to put it slightly less vividly, but what he said in that is the police officer, uh, she didn't have the right pass to uh, get out of the uh, turnstile that she was going out of, and the police officer facilitated her through that because there was no one else available. That's essentially what just... Stephen House's letter says. But I refer you to his letter because you know, he's, he's responsible, he is responsible for that. Um, uh, as for, the, as for the, um, uh, the, the, the case itself, we don't, I'm not going to be drawn on individual personnel cases because obviously there, there's, a, there's a degree of uh, pr privacy around the individuals we have to protect. So has there been an investigation launched? Um, well, I think, the, I think the facts of the case are, 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 are clear, but as I said, I don't want to, get, I don't want to be drawn into individual personnel case because um, uh, that, might, is... that, might, well, that might yet still be the subject of, um, uh, of, of further action. So you can't say if there's an inquiry ongoing? Uh, the we, don't, we don't comment on individual cases. I can talk about the general principles and the rules, but we never comment on individual cases. Um, just the only reason I've been able to comment on the involvement of the police officers is because Sir Stephen House has actually I mean, um, I responded to, uh, I forget which MP, but, but, but it might be Mr Doughty, but anyway, uh, an MP's letter on it. In this kind of instance... Um, well, particularly with this one, Helen McNamara, who is the um, the ethics czar of the civil service, do you discuss these things with her, and have you had a conversation about this case? Well, Hen Helen McNamara is my one of my closest colleagues. She's the deputy secretary to the cabinet and oversees the propriety and ethics um, uh, team, among yeah. uh, other things. And of course, I discuss all uh, all issues with her. But I don't want to. Again, I'm not going to. Uh, in a parliamentary committee, talk about the internal conversations I, mean, I have with say, my well, closest. What did she say? But an, an opinion has been expressed, has it? Um, again, I don't want to. Uh, you know, this is somebody I speak to all the time. I talk to her about all sorts of things. I, don't, I really don't think I should be disclosing the internal. I've given you every opportunity. Um, He's very smooth. The chair made it very clear on the, the respect for the impartiality and the, the diligence of the civil servants. So I'm surprised that Dominic Cumming, who is a hired gun, has got the authority to sack somebody in sort of senior position, a, a special advisor to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Well, he spent, um, sorry, the, micro oh, the microphone, sorry, the, I thought the microphone hadn't quite uh, worked. Um, so special advisors are essentially a hybrid. They are temporary civil servants in employment terms, but they serve at the discretion of the Prime Minister. So essentially, like ministers, they serve at the discretion of the Prime Minister. So if a minister resigns, the special advisors resign as well, and then there are particular, um, uh, there's a particular package um, which uh, applies to special advisors. So uh, uh, any special advisor serves at the discretion of the Prime Minister and, it, and in the end it's the Prime... Uh, uh, as well as supporting their individual Secretary of State uh, or, or Cabinet Minister and in the end it's a decision for the Prime Minister whether uh, or not to terminate their employment. So you wouldn't be expecting Dominic Cummings to sack other civil servants? Uh, no one uh, can sack civil servants um, uh, except through uh, the disciplinary... Um, procedures that we have uh, discussed, and that's that's done within the civil service uh, code, and of course um, within employment law. But you can cite special advisors. Well, as I said, the prime minister, the special advisors serve at the discretion of the prime minister, so it is the prime minister's decision um, as to whether special advisors continue or not. And the generally, for example, if ministers resign, the special advisors are expected to resign at the same time. Um, can, can you just explain what is the correct procedure for? investigating and taking action following a, a suspected leak by a special advisor? Uh, exactly the same as it would be um, for uh, anyone else. So we would investigate the leak itself, of course, and if that uh, investigation took us to um, a special advisor um, as the source, then, um, the, then the, the, um, the, in that case, then the 
uh, special advisor code applies, and the Prime Minister um, would need to make a decision as to whether to continue with that special advisor's employment. Um, and how confident are you that the proper procedures were followed in this case? Well, again, I don't want to comment on the individual okay. case, Mr Chairman, right. because uh, uh, if okay. I, there's a standard, uh, there's a standard. Because if I comment on one, I might have to comment on others, and, and we don't comment on individual personnel cases, not least because we, we okay, need to leave some latitude for the individual concerned to pursue whatever course of action they may wish. But you said a moment ago that the um, special advisors are employed um, at the pleasure of the Prime Minister, um, and it's the Prime Minister's decision whether to let a special advisor go. Um, uh, was the Prime Minister aware of the decision being made on his behalf at the time it was made? Well, again, um, I don't want to comment on the individual case, but it's, it is, I think you've set out the formal position uh, very clearly, um, and I, um, I don't want to be drawn okay, to the individual fine. case. It wouldn't be right for me to do so. Thank you. Simple question. Would special advisors be eligible for membership of the FDA, the trade union? And if so, could they seek representation from the FDA in, in, a, in a case of uh, dismissal or whatever? Um, I don't think so, but I must admit it hasn't, uh, because the FDA really represents permanent civil servants. But I must admit it's not a question that I've ever, um, I've ever confronted. So um, perhaps I could take that away, Mr. Hopkins, and, and just make sure that I, I've given you the correct answer. But I th my understanding, will, I think, would be, would be no. Well, I think uh, it doesn't mean, well, to the second part of the question, of course, anyone is entitled to have representation um, in an employment case. And that's a, that's, a, that's a right of every employee, and employment law covers uh, everyone. But the specific question on the FDI, I think, is probably no, but let me check. Or any, uh, or, but presumably any special advisor could be a member of any union they, they, they're eligible to be a member of. Um, yes, in a, in, a personal, in a personal capacity, but I was assuming that Mr Hopkins was talking oh, right. about the FDA as the civil services, as one of the civil services uh, unions. I, don't, I genuinely don't know, let me check. Um, I, I don't, I'm not aware of that ever having been the case, so I, I think my presumption is no. Do um, SPAD, some of them, join the FDA? In this article? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Can I just ask, um, are special advisors at the level within government whereby that they shouldn't be a member of a political party? Um, uh, special advisors sometimes are and sometimes aren't. Um, and of course, civil servants are permitted to be members of political parties. They're just not permitted to take place in national uh, take part, sorry, in national political activity. Okay. Um, can we move on, um, Mr. Jones? Yes. Could we move on to to No Deal planning? Um, the Prime Minister took office on the 24th of July, having made it very clear during his campaign for election as leader of the Conservative Party that he intended to ensure that the UK left the European Union uh, on the 31st of October, as he put it, no ifs, no buts. Um, what major new major programmes for No Deal planning have been introduced since uh, he took office? John might want to uh, add something, perhaps I can just make a couple of points. First. Of course, we were already doing a great deal of no deal planning. We did it for the, uh, uh, in, the, in the spring. And so um, most of the portfolio, I think nearly all of the portfolio, has essentially picked up plans that were already, already being made. There are no sort of wholly new areas that we weren't already addressing, unless John wishes to correct me. We changed the governance, uh, the central governance around it. So Michael Gove as uh, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, um, uh, is that, that portfolio is focused on no-deal preparation. There's no-deal preparedness. Indeed, Brexit preparations, operational preparations and preparedness, not just, uh, not just no-deal, and there's some new cabinet governance uh, around it. Um, uh, and in general, of course, we've, as you will have seen, there's been a, uh, re a refueling of many of the programmes that we uh, already had in place in order to ensure that we're ready on the 31st. I don't know if there are any specifics, John, you wanted to add. Well, to the new... Um uh, the new governance has taken place. There's been a new cadence to uh, uh, the civil service ar or, um, arrangements and organisation, and that has not been unhelpful, frankly, to inject new energy into the system. Uh, there has been a uh, major new uh, communications plan launched, both to the public and to the business, to ensure business readiness. And, of course, because there has been more time, there, have been more, there has been more progress, both on the building of systems, the minimal viable products are a little better now than they were, uh, there's been continued progress on international agreements, uh, so there's been a number of things that, that have happened by virtue of more time, 
um, and there has been and there's been some sort of reshaping a bit of certain uh, certain things. Uh, I mean, from the large, we are now proactively uh, issuing what they call EORI numbers to the small businesses that trade uh, to Europe. That wasn't happening before. There are one or two um, additional funds available for UK nationals in Europe that were not available before. So there are a range of things that have happened, whether that, that are different to what had happened. But these are essentially programmes that were already in the pipeline, but have been given new impetus and new governance arrangements. Is that I think in large part that is a true statement, partly because the civil service, as I've said before, was largely ready, as ready as it could be. Uh, although I would say to you that the communications in particular, I think, stand out as a big step change in um, uh, uh, pace and energy and, and focus, actually. What has happened uh, material to, materially to affect uh, Operation Yellowhammer uh, plans since the new uh, Prime Minister took office, um, if anything? No. Well, as you recall, uh, uh, Operation Yellowhammer um, is, a, um, is a reasonable worst-case assumption against which we can plan, um, uh, but it brings with it operational preparedness on the ground for day one and the relatively short period thereafter. From the 12th of April, those uh, operational preparedness arrangements were stood down, largely. Uh, they have been ramped back up again, or, and are in the process of being ramped back up again, uh, because we have to re-put in place the 24-7 operations, the control rooms and such things. Uh, uh, could so, you just, sorry to interrupt, but could you explain why they were stood down? They were stood down because um, uh, it was clear that, a, that, that, we, that the 31st of October was the next point at which we might exit Europe with no deal. Uh, we were ready for the, 12th, for the 29th of March and the 12th of April, uh, and then the next moment was the 31st of October, and people are working 24-7 in shifts. Uh, and we didn't want to have them working 24-7 in shifts between the period of April to October, so we stood them back down. Uh, the plans existed, and the plans were getting better and better, and they're and better Presumably now. the plans were being developed as well, I, I uh, Continue to be developed. I think they continue to get better. Right. And so we're now in the process of ramping those people and plans back up, uh, ready for the 31st of October. And are they now ramped up to a level that they were at previously when it was thought that we were leaving on the 29th of March? So the numbers uh, of people involved are actually rather greater this time than they were the last time. Uh, we are not at the point because many of, these, uh, many of the operational teams have to go into place relatively proximate to the moment at which they are needed, so probably in October. So we're not in October yet, so we're not ready to do that. So they're not quite at the place they were when we stood them down, but they are uh, well-developed plans. They're actually rather more. There's 2,600 people uh, uh, been I being identified to move around. Uh, uh, so they're better developed than they were, and they're ready to move at the appropriate time. Thank you. Can I just ask one thing? Sorry. Uh, just about, we talk about the ramping up of the no deal here, but what about um, for people abroad in Europe? Is there, has that been ramped up as well? Yeah, I mean, a large part of the communications that I've mentioned, or a part of the communications that I've mentioned, are, in, are intended for UK nationals overseas. There are large uh, numbers of pensioners, as you know, and people mm. are working over there. So the, the, um, the, the Foreign Office posts have been uh, ramped up as well, so that the communications can go through those places. There are targeted communications, there are funds available to help, there are um, uh, uh, societies that deal, you know, uh, uh, groups that deal with those groups of people who we are funding to communicate. So yes, the answer to your question is that they are being communicated with. Okay. Um, about the decision-making structure the new government has introduced, mm. how does it compare with what existed uh, in the run-up to March 30, March 29th, because my understanding that is it's much more ministerial led now, but that the civil service itself uh, was setting quite a healthy pace anyway, but we just didn't hear so much about it. How much of, how, how much of that can you um, talk yeah, I think, I, yes, it is, you're right, Mr Chairman, it is now ministerial led, so the uh, CDL, Michael Gove, chairs um, meetings every working day virtually uh, on it, a uh, new committee called EXO, uh, which has a wide range of cabinet ministers uh, on it, supported by officials. 
Uh, and that's a different approach uh, to the way we were doing it in the run-up to uh, uh, March when the ministerial committee met less frequently, sometimes under the, Prime Minister's, the then Prime Minister's chairmanship and sometimes under the then CDL's chairmanship, largely to resolve the big policy questions rather than the, the operational uh, 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 progress. And a committee either I chaired or John chaired um, or the uh, DEXU uh, permanent secretary chaired EUXTPO, so an official committee, um, uh, did the uh, assent of the operational work. And it's, it's, it's a different style, um, but, uh, 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 and, and therefore we've adapted the civil service mechanism supporting XO to, uh, to, to, to uh, support that new um, rhythm. I think we should say, just on, if I may, on the record, I mean, in, in, there has been new momentum, there has been new drive, and there have been some new programmes. What's rather pleasing is that the work that has been done by the civil service uh, in the first instance was being displayed to a new group of people and I think as I think Mark has already said the new group of people have generally found that that work was of high quality and good work so that's quite pleasing. Uh, briefly Mr Cowan. Toward the 31st of October we've heard the Prime Minister's statement no ifs no buts we're leaving but within the operation Yellowhammer is there a milestone in there for a no go no decision? Oh, there's a series of milestones. Um, for, for no, go, no decision. Uh, for go, no, go on. Is there a point when you go back to the Prime Minister and say, look, we cannot guarantee medical supplies, we cannot guarantee to, to maintain the food supply chain, you have to change your mind on this? There are a series, of course, of, uh, of decisions, some of which have already been taken. We have, as you have seen, recontracted for freight capacity, which might be needed in the event of a no deal on the 31st of October. And there are a series of such decisions which run... Uh, and that was the first one that popped up. But there will be a series of others going forward. I can't remember them all now. But uh, uh, that so, so that we, so that the our job is to prepare in the event that Britain leaves the European Union on the 31st without a deal. So there will be a series of such decisions being taken. But particularly on the medical supplies. If it's between now and the 31st of October, the people behind Operation Yellowhammer are convinced that we cannot supply all the medical supplies, including radioactive isotopes, mm -hmm. and adrenaline, and, uh, and insulin, and methadone. Yeah. Will there be a decision where you, are you in a position where you can go to the Prime Minister and say, look, this cannot happen? Um, so, with regard to medical supplies particularly, there's a structured response, uh, which is already underway, and indeed the freight that I have discussed is a part of that response. In addition, there's uh, about four, more than 400 suppliers that, that we're in contact with talking about what they're doing to build stocks so that would be the first thing ditto medical devices uh, the contingency in the event that the short straits and where most of that most of those goods come into the UK mm. is blocked the contingency is the freight but there are also air uh, what they call an air bridge so airplanes being contracted and that is a that is in process as I speak it hasn't been awarded but there is an air bridge contracting process to allow airplanes to bring the isotopes and the short cycle uh, emergency medical supplies. So, the, so all of the steps are being taken in order that we won't run out of medicines in this country on the 31st of October if we leave it that idea. But, but if you get close to that date, can you go back to the Prime Minister and say you've got to back off from this? Because there's no ifs, no buts. Is that one of those red lines we never cross? But if people's health is at risk on the 30th of October, can you go back to them and say you've got to change your mind? Well, as, as we've said, we can't mitigate every single consequence and, and because some of those things depend on others. But in the end, uh, the, the, the Prime Minister and the government need to make the decision, just as the last one did. We will provide them with the evidence of the, uh, uh, of the state of national preparedness, not just the state of government preparations, and they'll make the decision. Our job, however, as John has suggested, is to ensure that those preparations are in the best possible shape, and in particular, issues like medical isotopes and supplies of that kind, we have the contingency plans in place, were we to leave without a deal, uh, to ensure that those supplies continue uninterrupted. And that's essentially the expectation um, ministers have put on us, and indeed put on us, uh, put on us in March. But of course, we continue to um, advise ministers on the state of national preparedness, uh, and uh, ministers in any government, of course, then need to uh, reach whatever political decisions they reach. The Prime Minister and the government have been very clear about the 31st of October. Uh, it's the decision in international law until, uh, uh, unless and until uh, change, so we have to be ready for it. 
Um, yes, yeah, so Mark, you told us in February that um, you cannot fully mi mitigate the consequences of no deal. Um, and since then, we've had all these billions of pounds poured in. What um, risks of no deal Brexit? Which aspects of those can't, can't be mitigated? Well, what I, I think I was explaining at the time and have done in one or two um, uh, further events since is making the point that there are some, there's some elements of, of national preparedness, if I use that phrase, that are out with government's control. And we, therefore we can't fully mitigate them. The communications campaign is designed to try and ensure that citizens and businesses make all the right decisions for the 31st of October. But as I think I might have said in, uh, in, in uh, uh, previous sessions, um, uh, we can push out as much information in the most effective and professional way possible. But of course, if the front pages are telling people something different, they will make their own decisions according to their own appreciation of the impact on themselves, the impact on their business, and their appreciation of the, uh, of the likely um, outcome. So we're, doing, we're, we're communicating with people. The judgments they make will depend as much on their appreciation of the overall political position as it will be on the information government is um, proposing, that they, proposing that they take. And they'll make, they will make rational decisions on that basis. That is out with, that is out with our control. Those are individual deci decisions of citizens and businesses. Second, of course, we don't yet know exactly what decisions the EU will take um, around no deal preparedness. We, are, we have had conversations with them. We're not in formal negotiations with them. We've had conversations with them. But of course, again, a lot will depend on the overall tenor of our negotiations. Those are things that we can uh, do contingency planning against. But if, but if, for example, the EU takes you know, a particular position on data adequacy or something of that kind, then there's only so much we can do. And is the likelihood still a million to one? Well, that wasn't um, that wasn't my phrase, and I think the I think the Prime Minister has has very updated very, that very, very okay. briefly, Mr. Jones. Oh, sorry, I just yes. had one. Just to I've got one more question. Yeah, yeah. That point. The, um, the 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 website has now been up and running for nine or ten days. Um, the new one, yes. Yeah. Yes, the new one. How, what sort of impact has that had since it was uh, publicised? So the, uh, we're at the front end of, uh, of the communications campaign and it's going to ramp up from here. So we're at the very early stage. It's been substantially enhanced. The website can deal with 20,000 requests a second. Um, so it's ready to handle all of the things. Uh, it's, got, uh, it's substantially upgraded uh, to be more user-friendly from a user's perspective. So if you're a trucker, go on and you need to know what to do, then it gives you step by step, all of those things. We're beginning to see, very, very early though, uh, um, uh, because, uh, because we haven't actually gone very public with the communications campaign that I've referred to. It's, it's beginning to ramp up from here. So I think this is all for the next few weeks, actually. You, you say it could handle 20,000 hits a second. Is, is that the sort of level it's, it's receiving at the moment? No. No, in here. What sort of level is it? I, I don't have that information. Actually. Would you be able to give us a, a note? Probably. Uh, what I can I can give you that it's done about fourteen million uh, requests a week. Oh, that, that's what I wanted to know. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Just one other small thing that's also beyond your control. Yeah. Do you believe a strong parliament is a help or a hindrance to the executive? <laughs> that's a that's a small question. Well. Um, um, it's our system, of course. Of course, a strong parliament is part of our democracy, and uh, we're held accountable. And parliament takes decisions and so on. But I think it's a PhD thesis, or maybe one for lectures I might give when I'm retired, rather than it's an rather choice. than for now. <laughs> A weak parliament that won't make any decisions. It's a binary um, multiple choice, isn't it? Um, um, which seems to be the parliament that we've got. Can I just go back to me? Very briefly. Um, I think, in common with um, uh, my colleague MPs, we're receiving from constituents a great deal of correspondence um, because they have been made fearful that their supplies of medicines um, are not going to be forthcoming in a no deal uh, situation. Um, are you aware of that pressure that is coming um, onto MPs from their constituents and the genuine fear that these people have? And is there some way you can address this? Um, because your answers today probably need to be communicated more widely, um, particularly when it comes to isotopes, isotopes and, and short-lived um, medical um, um, I'm only aware in a general sense uh, on the basis of uh, perceived demand and therefore um, uh, orchestrated uh, capacity. Um, I'm not aware of the individual things, but to the extent that people are concerned, 
I will take that away and make sure that we, we a we are sure that we're dealing with all of these concerns because I think I believe we are because it's an aggregated demand and supply, uh, and then see if we can orchestrate the communications campaign in order to and, set people's mind more at rest. And particularly the pharmacies, I think, are coming under a great deal of of, of stress. They're getting a lot of inquiries on this front now, and um, I gather some of the specialist magazines have been um, putting up. Um, uh, well, in my constituency, they put up an A board saying, don't blame us for, for medicine shortages, write to your MP. Um, but in fact, some of the shortages have been due to pharmaceutical companies and their manufacturing yeah. um, elements. I really do feel this area needs um, a great deal of increase in terms of communications. If you could do that and write to the committee as to what you're doing, that would be very helpful. Sure. Could I just... Um, yes, Mr. Jones. Well, uh, Again, um, with apologies for coming in again, but there's one uh, example, one specific example that I had in a public meeting the other day where we were discussing Brexit, and that was the issue of EpiPens, yeah. uh, which are used in, in the case of anaphylactic shock. Uh, apparently, these are not readily available. Uh, they're having to cope with they're having to cope with used ones. Uh, on um, inquiry, I discovered that EpiPens are actually manufactured in the United States, and there's a worldwide shortage of EpiPens, completely unrelated to the EU. The problem is that these issues are becoming conflated, and I really think that some form of information campaign, as Dame Cheryl says, would be really very helpful. Yes, make exactly the same point for EpiPens. Um, can I just make a point, or ask a question? Is there any evidence that uh, countries of the European Union, the other countries, or the European Union itself actually wants to frustrate the uh, vital medical supplies getting to the United Kingdom. And um, if such a shortage was anticipated in any way, um, what, what evidence is there that they would not want to, want to cooperate in order to make sure that we had medical supplies? Well, that helps to make sure a shortage doesn't rise yes. and to make sure we have... Uh, I, think, I think we need, we need to distinguish... Uh, uh, between deliberate and inadvertent. It is possible that supply chains could clog up, not because there's any desire to do so, but just because, for example, the, the short straights are, um, are, are just clogging up with traffic or, uh, and so on. And so these procedures are designed not um, against a deliberate attempt by anyone to try and restrict metals to supplies, but if it inadvertently uh, the, the, the side effects of other um, uh, uh, um, blockages at the border or whatever have that effect. Uh, but there's absolutely no indication of that, and, and uh, one wouldn't expect it. So these are contingency plans drawn up in order to ensure that the supplies continue smoothly. But given that the director of the Calais port has said that the um, traffic will be free-flowing and that there will be no unnecessary checks, um, 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 unless somebody insists on applying extensive unnecessary checks, these, these well, scenarios seem rather unlikely. Uh, but but our, job, our job is our contingency job is planning. To, exactly. And it doesn't have to be reasonable worst case. Yeah. Um, and, and as you know, the flow through the short straits is at such a high level of intensity that even a handful of necessary checks does have an effect. But, but a great deal of work has been done both sides. The French have now invested in infrastructure. I have to say, I think there should so let's, still let's be go some to, risk. Let's go to Eleanor Smith. There are still risks. There are still, there are still okay. risks. Eleanor Smith. So, is what is the current status of the HMRC and border force capabilities for conducting additional checks at the borders? So quite a lot of work has been done. I mean, I, just to get this in the right perspective, the, uh, as, as Marcus said, any shortages will not be as a result of people wanting to impose shortages on the UK, but they may arise, some may arise, as a result of a clogging up of the various critical uh, bridges between continental Europe, the, the interfaces between continental Europe and the UK. Uh, the French have said that they will do checks for things going into France, and therefore our concern is to make sure that all of the lorries and trucks going into France have the right paperwork and such things. So that, of course, comes to the Border Force and HMRC's preparedness. So a number of things um, have happened. For instance, we have introduced a series of um, pop up. Uh, checking points, 29 so far identified, we're looking uh, um, uh, uh, toward 100, all around the country so that trucks on their way to the port can be checked, that they have the right paperwork so they don't get holed up in France and therefore don't cause a backup. Uh, Border Force will man those, uh, uh, those posts. They have hired about 900 people since last March. 
they are funded for another thousand, of which about 200 to 300 are in place, uh, and, they're, and, they're, and they're building for the rest in order to man those pop-up um, uh, uh, places. Um, uh, then there are a series of um, six, I think, uh, under something called Operation Brock, which is that in the event that Dover does start jamming up, mm -hmm. there are places to put trucks. There's 11,000 places to put trucks in a tiered manner. And again, there will be people in those truck stops to check the paperwork or to allow people to help, help people complete the paperwork so that when they do get over to the other side, they can pass straight through. So all of these are... Uh, uh, are the sort of things uh, um, HMRC uh, has I think is about is it about 3,000 extra people thus far plan to get to a, somewhere between five and 6,000 uh, in the sh period shortly after day one so we're, you can see we're ramping up both mm. Border Force and HMRC to in preparation for the sorts of things that we're talking about yeah, and they've just talked about the stockpiles of um, medicine. So how likely is it that we'll not have enough sufficient med stockpiles of medicines and medical supplies? Well, I think all of the steps we're taking are intended to mitigate exactly against not having them. Um, uh, and that is why, uh, controversial though it was the first time around, it was, an, and I've said it before in public, it was exactly the right thing to do to contract for extra ferry capacity. Uh, we did it a bit late last time, we're doing it a bit earlier this time, uh, and we're doing it therefore in a way that is a, a little more compliant and a little easier to, to do. That is That contract uh, is in standstill right now, it'll be awarded in the next week or two, so that puts in place the capacity. Uh, then of course it's up to how well we can manage the forecasting activity around which ports are getting jammed, where we can buy that extra capacity. The air bridge does the um, does the emergency uh, short short cycle medicines and such things. So all of these, I can't tell you exactly whether there will be any uh, issues or not, but we're doing everything that we possibly can in order to mitigate against it. In, in a sentence, given that the CDL and Cabot Office is, is coordinating no-deal planning, what does DEXIU do? So Dexu, so officials in Dexu and the cabinet office are working in essentially a single collective group. Right. So okay. a lot of Dexu officials are supporting CDL in the operational preparations. We decided, because of the pressure of time, not to do the traditional big machinery of government change because it would have disrupted those right. preparations. So essentially, officials in Dexu and the cabinet office, in a, essentially one team, are supporting CDL on um, preparedness, deal or no deal. Um, Stephen Barclay, uh, Deputy Secretary of State, on the negotiations that he is pursuing at his level, deal or no deal, and David Frost, the Prime Minister's Sherpa, in his negotiations as well. Um, and they all work under the supervision of Claire Moriarty, who's the Permanent Secretary of Deputy. David Jones. There's a WMS down today, actually might already be out yeah. uh, on that change. Oh, very good, thank you. Or actually lack of change. You anticipated <laughs> I was going to ask the question. Uh, David Jones. Uh, yes, Mr. Manzoni, uh, you described how preparations were ori originally ramped up towards the 29th of March. They were then um, stood down. We then had, is it now being ramped up again? What would be the impact on preparations if it were decided not to go ahead with the EU exit on the 31st of October? Uh, we're, we're, we're pretty good at that by now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, uh, we, we, our job is to get ready for the 31st. If, if, if it turns out that it doesn't happen on the 31st, we will uh, uh, we'll do exactly what we did on the 29th of March and the 12th of April, um, uh, which is that those people who have moved into position to be ready in the control rooms and such things uh, will, over time, and it doesn't happen overnight, of course, but over time they'll be uh, moved back, uh, depending upon when the next likely date might be. Well, it's a bit grand old Duke of York, isn't it? And aren't your officials getting very fed up with this? Um, I think, as Mark has said, the, uh, uh, um, I, I think one of the positives uh, of a daily preparation meeting is that it does re-inject energy into a system, uh, and it's done that quite effectively, actually. Okay. And the civil service will respond. Moving on, Mr. Cowan. Thank you very much. It's been suggested that the Get Ready for Brexit public information campaign, last budget I heard rumoured was £100 million, is designed to serve political purposes. What's your response to that? 
uh, we've applied all the rules that we apply to other government communications campaigns uh, to this one. Um, there are precedents. I think there was a get ready campaign for entry to the single market. Uh, there was a campaign around the millennium bug. Um, uh, and uh, this, one apply, this one operates within all the same rules as others. Some of those have been controversial too, but this one applies, the same rules apply. Would your view of that change if we entered the PERDA period? Obviously, in PERDA, all government communications have to be handled with particular care and sensitivity. And so were we to enter a, a, a general election in a PERDA period, then uh, we would have to apply that, uh, uh, that lens uh, to it. But it is possible to continue with information campaigns, but obviously when PERDA they, they have to be handled with great sensitivity and care and there'd be some adjustments made. But the very nature of the what's it called, get ready for Brexit campaign is pretty much the you know, keep calm and carry on type mentality. Well, I think it's actually more uh, about saying to people not keep calm and carry on, it's actually um, uh, work out what it is you need to do for mm. Brexit on the 31st of October. Here's how, here's how to find the information you need make those preparations. I think it, uh, it's much more outlined yeah. facts yeah. Okay. for what people need to do. And, what was and, and in the modern era, of course, it is possible. You know, the new website is really good. I, know, I would recommend uh, Mr Chairman, you and colleagues have a look at it. It is possible to do through drop-down menus, get essentially the bespoke uh, yeah. answer to your, to your requirements. Whereas with previous campaigns, just the nature of the technology meant we had to tell, essentially tell everybody everything. Um, uh, and of course, inevitably, they were more generic. This is, this is like anything in the digital era, enables people to be more self-servant and more, more bespoke. And it's, I think it's a pretty good... Two, pretty two, good. two, two of no. on the website, I recommend it. Two of, the, well, two of those facts, presumably, which will be given out to the haulage industry, as we talked on earlier, is that the European Conference of Ministers ECMT permits, uh, there were 11,392 applications, and the UK can only allocate 984, which by my quick reckoning means we've got... 10,500 HGV licensed drivers who cannot drive an HGV no, across, two across things, Europe. Two things on that. The first is the numbers are not quite right. There's actually 1,622 permits available. Well, the uh, application and was 11,000. And there's an additional 4,824 short-term permits available. Okay, so we're still 6,000 short. But they, are, but they are not per driver. They are per company, generally. So, um, of course, there is... Um, so, that's the first point. The second point... The European Union has said up until December this year that actually UK drivers, or indeed drivers driving in Europe, uh, are, are able to continue as they are today. So there is a, a period beyond October at least where I think that all of that can continue. Of course, uh, and, and discussions go on, of course, to try to ease that situation. But that is, I mean, what, you, you know, you have described one of the issues that the hauliers are dealing with yep. in a no-deal Brexit situation, but I just wanted to get the numbers right. Okay. We we'll hope that we'll the 60,000 drivers that come from Eastern Europe that are having their citizenship question. Um, well, uh, the, the, so the government's policy on settlement, of course, is that essentially everyone, you know, there's, there's essentially continuity through that, uh, through that period, and there are many drivers, of course, from Eastern Europe um, who, are not, who, who's, um, who, who will drive here under their existing citizenship. the success for the Get Ready for Brexit campaign? So there are a series of metrics that are being developed actually now. Um, uh, because it primarily directs people to the website, we can do quite a lot of analytics, analytics on the website about what journeys are being followed, how many people leave successfully from that website, that they find all of the information. So there's quite a lot of analytics we can do. Uh, we can track on um, a, a, a uh, on a uh, on a business um, for the business groups because we have nine step what they call step by step processes so we can track the numbers of the business groups who go there. We are additionally uh, introducing a series of surveys both with the public citizens and with businesses so that we can routinely sort of check where those uh, are and those will be ramped up. So there are a series of metrics around the success and readiness of the population and businesses uh, as we re launch the campaign. Okay, so um, so you will know that its um, campaign is on track 
and how it meets its objectives by those very things that you're Those are the metrics. Campaign. I mean, like any communications campaign, these things are a little bit uh, subjective, but this mm -hmm. campaign, as Marcus said, is, is uh, in fact, we've introduced uh, an assurance panel to, because it's been done in some, at uh, some pace, we've introduced a specific assurance panel to make sure that it's got all of the right uh, controls and metrics and that it's done in a professional way. In addition, we have we have external auditors checking that we're not, uh, you know, that the, that the media buys are sensible and the right price. All of those normal checks are going on uh, and the metrics are being developed as we speak. Okay, so what further measures will you um, adopt if the businesses and citizens are not taking appropriate mitigation measures for the no deal? Well, I think, uh, I mean, the, the campaign is designed to target individuals, to make it easier for everybody uh, to get their, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a 60 second checker on the website that says if you want to come onto this website, in 60 seconds we'll tell you what you need to do by asking a series of questions. Uh, so I think that, that it, this campaign has been designed to get the maximum uh, uh, contact and access to both individual citizens and businesses. There are lots of other things happening. There are uh, a series of events around the country uh, where the forums are being and events are being held. There are uh, extensive campaigns through the various business representative organisations, the CBI, the Small Business Federation, all of those are happening. So there's a very, very significant ramp up of, um, uh, uh, of, of activity. In the end, of course, uh, you can take it to water, but you can't force it to drink and... We'll see. Okay. Um, can I um, ask um, how good your communications are with members of Parliament on this subject? And if part of your communication um, campaign, and I'll tell you why, I've had an email whilst this session is on um, from somebody saying that uh, she's had a letter from a member of Parliament saying that no deal Brexit would lead to food and medicine shortages. Uh, and uh, this person says it's causing uh, hysteria and mistrust, and presenters also in the media are feeding through that misinformation. It would seem to me, I, I can't verify it, but uh, it seems a very straightforward email that's come in to me, it would seem to me that we do need to have a clear communication strategy with members of Parliament so that that sort of um, uh, misinformation is not issued to people, which is also helping cause disquiet and fear, which we should be allaying at this time. Well, I, I'd be surprised if uh, the MP concerned was uh, representing information they'd been given directly by government. Of course, what MPs say to the public is a matter for them. Uh, I, th I think, as you said earlier, Dame Cheryl, we do need to try and make sure that the right information is available to MPs. What you will make of it, of course, is then a matter for you. But. The, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster gave a statement in Parliament last week. He's committed to continue to keep Parliament updated on this. We have a lot of correspondence. Uh, obviously, we need to look and see whether there's anything further we can do um, in terms of pushing uh, uh, useful information to MPs. What I would ask all MPs to do is to advise people who have concerns uh, about their own situation is to go to the website, have a look, see what they need to do, see if they still have concerns um, at uh, at the end of it, because that's that is what that is designed to achieve. Because of that website, what should they search? Gov.uk. Gov.uk. Gov. Just Brexit. straight to Brexit. Gov.uk. Gov. Gov. Brexit. Yeah. Good. So everybody's now got that quite clear. Yeah. Very good. Um, By the way, it used to be EU Brexit, and it was Actually, Brexit was better. Cabinet Secretary, none of my colleagues have got, got any further questions, questions for you in particular. Uh, it might be expedient for you to take advantage of that. Because um, I'm sure that other matters are waiting for you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Colleagues, thank you very much. For um, your time. Thank you, and for your support for the civil service once again. Thank, thank you. you. And if Mr. Manzoni, you can stay for a few more minutes, we'd be very grateful. Um, Mr. Hopkins. Yes, Jay, let me just borrow uh, Dame Cheryl's last, last point. I, I don't think there's any evidence that British companies want to stop selling to the big EU market, and the EU companies don't want to stop selling to the, British, the very large British market. And indeed, there is reports that the Calais authorities are very concerned to make sure that f trade flows very smoothly because they might lose trade to other ports. That's a, a real concern they have. Anyway, um, large numbers of staff have transferred between departments and there have been changes of permanent secretary at key Brexit departments. How is the civil service coping with this level of churn? Well, it's not 
Uh, the level of churn inside the civil service um, uh, it, it, uh, it is uh, just under 10%. So the movement in the civil service generally is just under 10%. If that is compared with the outside market, which is closer to between 16 and 17%. So we, we actually, uh, in a general sense, if I look at the total civil service, we're actually pretty good on churn. If I go to the senior levels, um, uh, the total movement, uh, the, the, by the way, the movement between the inside of the civil service and the outside of the civil service is still well below the private sector. Uh, the, when you include the movement intra-civil service, then you're getting to 18 or 19 percent at the senior civil service level in the civil service, and that begins to be of some concern because that is a little bit too high. We're doing various things, uh, none of which is a quick fix, but we're doing various things. In the short term, we have various uh, retention allowances for particularly pivotal roles. We have introduced for Brexit and for the uh, uh, European exit preparations, because of course people get up to speed and in the normal way of the civil service would then be inclined to go and look for something else. So we're holding them in place a little longer with some financial incentives, which are all uh, approved and, and, and are being utilised. So we're doing some things in the short term. In the long term, as you know, because we've spoken about this before, I, uh, we're building career paths which look different for civil servants. We are uh, starting to uh, uh, introduce a culture which, which um, values experience as opposed to just pure intellect. Uh, all of those things are being put in place in the long term with some success. We, I mean, there's 10 or 12 professions now which have defined career paths, defined accreditation levels. We're putting remuneration uh, patterns in for some of those professions. All of that is happening in the long term. Now, at the permanent secretary level, actually, if you examine what's happened in the last 12 months, uh, I think there have been five, there have been six appointments and five permanent secretaries leaving. That's about average. If there's about 30 odd permanent secretaries that have five year contracts, about right. So, no, there's nothing actually out of the ordinary in, in this matter at the moment. Of course, it's more acute where particular posts move, uh, but actually, we've handled that, I think, uh, relatively smoothly. There's a, a matter uh, which I've raised a number of times in this committee in different settings, different contexts. And that is the retention of corporate memory within the civil service. What is the civil service doing to, to ensure that corporate mem memory is not lost during the changes that have been taking place? So, um, look, in general, I agree with you, and we're trying to put in place long term structures which adjust this. And as the chair knows well, we are reintroducing uh, institutions in some senses which are intended to do that. We have a civil service leadership academy, which is a little bit nascent, but is building in strength. Uh, which is intended to embody the corporate memory, uh, the corporate leadership philosophy, the corporate knowledge. Um, uh, that's building quite well. Uh, uh, we're getting increasingly coherent, I think, with, uh, with the civil service leadership training and the, and the various development processes as a, as a civil servant progresses through the system. So uh, I, 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 I think it is an important aspect. Uh, we need, you know, um, we're on. We've now appointed a, um, uh, a head of that civil service leadership academy who is now uh, making the case to strengthen it and deepen it, find a place for it so that it's got a place as opposed to multiple places, that sort of thing. So I think this is a building agenda. Yeah. Um, just chip in there. Yes, What's happened to the Europe unit that possessed all the? corporate knowledge about the negotiations because there seems to be a dramatic reduction in the number of people. Well, it's only, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit, um, it just looks like it. As Mark has said, actually what we've done is we've, we've, uh, uh, we have created a single body of capability parked it in DEXU um, so that those, and, and that does both implementation and negotiation. So the capability still exists. The civil service is still supporting what used to be sitting in the European, just it just so so the report in the in the Times this morning that somehow that this is evidence of the government's lack no, of it's not right because uh, it was it, it's a, like all these things it's it's a sort of partial truth it is true that there are very far fewer people in the Europe unit today it's just that the support is coming from a different place but there's just as many people supporting there the are just, in fact there's probably more probably more thank you moving on yes if I can pursue the corporate memory um, theme. A little further. At the very simplest level, just recording meetings, proper note taking, recording of decisions, and it's not just for today and making sure that 
um, government works sufficiently, but also for the historical record. It's very important. People like me are very interested in, in the 30-year rule and what was said 30 years ago. And I think if civil servants and politicians are conscious of the fact that they are going to be recorded and it will be the, on the historical record, that's very important and very part of our, uh, our, our government tradition and very, very strong. W would you agree with that? In general, I think it's more difficult these days because of, in the digital age, as you know, the, uh, the records are rather more difficult to, and we're doing, working very hard to try to make sure that we can accommodate that in the digital age, I agree with you. Mm. Yes, um, and my final question, what, what are you doing to minimise the disruption to other work of the civil service as a result of staff moves and preparations for a no-deal Brexit? Um, it's obviously having an impact. Um, uh, and uh, we are, though, taking quite a lot of effort to make sure that priorities are being uh, sifted through, that we're continuously only doing the most important things. And I've always said, uh, A, too much is going on, and B, prioritisation never takes place unless it has to. Uh, we're in a situation now where it's actually having to take place because we are moving large numbers of people around. There are close to 17,000 civil servants working on Brexit today. Um, uh, and of course that means that other work is not taking place but the priorities are taking place this government has outlined its priorities those activities are still taking place the universal credit is still rolling out the transformation of the civil service is still taking place but there's a, undoubtedly a lot of other stuff that is not visible from the top or uh, uh, that is not taking place because there are 17,000 people working on Brexit today and actually I don't think that's a bad thing uh, uh, more prioritisation I would thoroughly support Is it possible that after Brexit um the numbers involved will steadily decline um, because most of the work will have been done. But is that is that? I think uh, well, we've got to. We, we are beginning now to think about some of that. It's early stages, but I do, I do think there's no question that uh, that there will be a bulge while we're dealing with uh, the issue du jour. But then I think we've got to get clear about what happens beyond. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so these thousands of civil servants are across all departments in Brexit planning. Hope so. In all these, yeah. So I, I have actually put down a load of written questions uh, about um, Dexu in particular, about retention, churn, length of service, type of contract, that kind of thing. Um, I just wondered. It came out on Friday that Dexu staff have had a bigger pay rise than anyone else in the civil service, seven point six percent, and I think the cumulative award more like eleven percent, which way exceeds the two percent annual guidance. There are a number of um, uh, there are a number of departments who have um, uh, uh, distinct pay arrangements. Dexu is one of them. DWP is another. Uh, there are FCO is another. There are several departments actually uh, because uh, in the last period uh, there has been an, uh, um, uh, an arrangement where, uh, provided you can make a case that the, the, the funding is still only 2%, is, is, is actually 1% from the Treasury. The funding available is 1%, provided you can make a case uh, through productivity or other means that, uh, uh, and DWP did it because they were out of state with HMRC for their large workforce. So provided you make a case through productivity that you can afford a higher pay deal, those have been approved by the Treasury. They, they need a business case, they need to be approved, they need all of that stuff. That has been uh, 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 you know what has happened over the course of of a, of a period of time. So there are a number of those in existence, and Dexu was just the most recent. Right. Is there any particular Dexu relate, um, Brexit related reason why that? Well, I mean, I think the the, the cases are made on their own merits. Um, uh, DWP, as I've said, was because it was out of step at an operational level with HMRC. For Dexu, it will be that this is a high stress, high pressure environment, and. Uh, and they're attempting to reduce the churn and the turnover. And of course people need to be rewarded for working long hours, weekends, you know, and all of that. And, th and I think that's probably, I haven't actually studied the Dexu business case, but I was aware that it was happening. And the 600 staff, is that kind of about average? For In Dexu? Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, uh, the departments vary wildly. Uh, it's a small department. I mean, there's, small. Okay. well, there's, there's tens of thousands in, in uh, HMRC and DWP. Do you know how much the government spent on consultancy services and temporary sort of agency type staff to help with Brexit preparations across? The well, as you know, I'm sure you know. Uh, this is a slightly complex question. Uh, I do know how much we have, we in the Cabinet have put in place a particular framework for consultants and assistance on uh, on Brexit. Uh, up to today, 
£55 million has been spent and about £75 million has been committed under that framework. Um, there are other measures of how much consulting has been used, and the NAO recently issued a report and said 1.5 billion in 1718 has been used in consultants. And what that threw up is a is a um, a complexity in how we record consultants. Actually, the the NAO number included professional services, um, and it was on Bravo, and it was on 220 uh, government and associated bodies. So what we're actually doing to resolve all this is to, is to re, um, reissue some guidance from the Cabinet Office about what is consulting, what is professional services, what the control should be on those. But I can tell you that £55 million, pounds, roughly 54.8 I think, has been spent on consultants from the And I Cabinet think De Office. Dex, who was originally envisaged as a kind of temporary department, a lot of those people had contracts up to the 29th of March. Which will have been extended. Um, uh, I don't know that they had contracts. But I think they might. They might have been loaner. I mean, actually, I'm not. Uh, yeah, they came from. They other might have been loaner. Yeah, of course they yeah. came. Most of them came from other yeah, departments. Yeah, as a temporary thing. Uh, through. There's no discussion that Dexu is going to be permanent. We haven't changed the point of view. Ask him. Yeah. So you don't have a lifespan in business for that department. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, this will never end. The NAO in 2019. Uh, sorry, in June of this year. Uh, did find a mismatch between the cabinet, cabinet Office analysis of what the bill is and uh, the individual departments. Uh, have you that been able to reconcile? Well, we have reconciled it, um, as I've just mentioned. That the, the NAO report dealt with what they call professional services, of course, of which consulting is some, and they took it off the Bravo system, which is the big government-wide accounting system, uh, and uh, they counted, and it was at 1.5 billion. What it threw up was that the uh, there was a, uh, a th th there was a lack of clarity of definition between consulting and professional services. So some of the professional services, for instance, were some of the MOD suppliers. So we are getting underneath it. It's taking a little time, but the cabinet offices, I think, in the course of next month, due to issue some new guidance, which will clarify this and get a better grip across government on professional services and consultants, and so we'll have a better idea. Is that a higher spend in DEXU than the other departments for these unelected bureaucrats, which the whole thing was meant to get rid of? I'm sorry, I haven't understood that Has question. DEXU had more of these consultants, agency staff, hourly paid, daily paid, different rates? I'm not, not, I, I, I'm not aware that they uniquely have. I mean, the, the numbers that I've just quoted are, are across government as a whole. There have been about a 1,000 people deployed and, and about uh, just under 160 engagements, and they're all across government. They're not uniquely indexed. Okay. Right. I mean, I might have an answer to that, because I did put all these down, but I just don't know if we have the plug pulled today, if I'll ever see those. And just lastly, how confident sorry. are you that you have the... Oh, sorry, was that your... Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was agreeing with you. The right data centrally to understand and improve efficiency of government consultancy spending. As I say, the purpose of Brexit was to get rid of unelected bureaucrats. One, um, of, them, one of them. I'm confident that we are getting better and as I've said we're going to reissue some guidance which will get underneath this definition of professional services consulting and it was thrown up by the NA report to be fair and, and um, you know what it, there, there, was a, there was a mismatch and we just need to get better and the guidance will be coming out in the next few weeks Thank you very much for um, a non-Brexit question <laughs> um, Mr Jones Yes, uh, I'm sure that you saw the uh, report in the Times last month about action fraud, um, which I think by any standards was extremely disturbing. Um, action fraud uh, is, of course, the telephone line that deals with reports of fraud and I believe handled about 500,000 cases last year. Uh, the Times uh, report uh, indicated that uh, poorly trained call handlers were dealing with uh, reports from the public, uh, that they dealt with these complaints in a highly unprofessional manner. People were made fun of. They were called such things as morons, screwballs, psychos. Um, that call handlers didn't actually identify to callers that they were not police officers. Many people, including a constituent of mine who was a professor of investigative psychology, thought he was dealing with police officers when he rang action for them. They never actually revealed that they're not police officers. Uh, and that they don't actually reveal to callers that very probably their complaints will not be investigated. Now, 
Uh, action fraud is overseen by the City of London Police, but it's managed on a day-to-day -day basis by Concentrix, uh, an American company with um, a, a previous uh, unfortunate record in handling government contracts. Um, the government must surely be extremely concerned about this report. Uh, w what is it doing to ensure that people who are often frequently distressed, quite naturally, are getting a proper level of service from what they believe is a police telephone line? Well, as you say, it's a, it, it, this is a City of London police contract, which is devolved from government. It's not to say that the Home Office don't have an interest and have taken an interest, and I, as I understand it, the Secretary of State for the Home Office has written to the City of London Police asking for an urgent review. The City of London Police have undertaken their own review, which has already resulted, as I understand it, in some personnel actions in that contract. So that is to do that. So that is a that is to some degree arm's length. That does not mean to say that we're not immediately interested in that. So of course we um, uh, uh, are aware of the concentrics issues. There are no concentric uh, contracts in government today. There were two. One was a DFT arms length body and the second one was in HMRC. And as you rightly mentioned, the HMRC one was terminated early in 2016 because of a concern that they were being, um, in a, they were handling uh, claim, uh, you know, claimants and things inappropriately. So that has been terminated. Um, uh, in fact, the, and the issue of um, how you handle fraud or how you go and collect debt and such things is quite live in government. We, uh, we, we deal with it a lot. We have a, um, a panel which is to do with, the, with fairness and equity as to how we handle those things when we, in, in anything that we control, and we do control these things through various ways. HMRC does its own um, uh, activity in this regard now. We also have uh, other uh, entities in government, and they're all under the auspices of the sort of fairness and uh, 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 panel which oversees this and makes sure that we do this in a proper way. The issue, of course, is that, I mean, and, I mean it is a very disturbing report. Um, uh, we can't look at every supplier to every part of the public sector. We do, though, and increasingly do, look at the big suppliers to government to make sure that they're behaving properly and well. Uh, we have um, uh, in central government a list of about 30 of those and in the MOD an increasing list and it, this is a program that is building across government so that we can increasingly get at for the big suppliers to make sure that such misbehaviour, if you like, or bad contracting doesn't happen. We are rolling out now uh, something called the Outsourcing Playbook which is a result of failures in the past has been uh, taken about 12 or 14 months to develop with, in concert with industry, with the big suppliers of government. It's a collaborative piece of work. There's 11, 10 or 11 policy areas where, uh, between government and industry, we're now progressing work to increase the transparency, to increase the visibility, to increase, to increase the felt accountability and responsibility, and the better management of all of these contracts. All of that is taking place. There was a single incident on Concentrix uh, with the City of London Police, as I say, and it's been jumped on. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the City of London Police, the exact timing for their investigation is, but I know the Home Office is waiting for some answers. Does Concentrix yes. remain a, an approved government contractor? Um, there, it, well, of course, I, I mean, it's quite complicated, this, because um, we're not allowed to... Uh, well, we have strictly, under European procurement laws, it's very hard to uh, 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 take account of one performance over here in a contract over here. <coughs> we have found ways of doing it, uh, and I, I, can, I think the answer to your question is that if they were to pop up again, uh, we would find a way to make sure that, that you know, unless they could persuade us that they, that they had got better. And we are in, for our big suppliers, we're in a lot of conversations about self-cleansing, as you know, we've had some of that going on, uh, so that we can be sure that when we get suppliers into government, they are doing the job that the public would expect them to do on behalf of their money. Whilst, as you rightly say, it's an arm's length arrangement, uh, would you be surprised if the City of London Police were not investigating whether or not con Concentric should continue to be a contractor for this very important service that they are providing to people who are very vulnerable? 
and who quite clearly are distraught when they, t- they, they call that telephone. My understanding is they are investigating. I would be surprised if they weren't. Yes. I would be surprised if they weren't, yes. Thank you. But, but is there some means of um, enabling meaningful due diligence when a public authority is considering um, letting a contract to a private contractor? I mean, surely there's a, a central source of information in the Cabinet Office about a great many, di- many contractors. Is that not available to other public authorities? Uh, for the big, what we call strategic suppliers, the answer to that is yes, it is available, but we don't cover all of the suppliers. And of course, as you well know, we've but, only but, begun this in the last t- two years, so it's building a capability. But I mean, if, if the, I mean, I'm concerned about what you say, that if there's a bad experience in one department, it can't be shared somewhere else. We have, uh, uh, it's quite hard to do under European procurement laws, um, uh, but we have found a way of, of uh, uh, beginning to do that. But this is fairly recent. I mean, we've been unable to do it under the law. Um, but how do you do it? I, as I was saying, I can't quite remember what the detail is because it's right. a fairly okay. convoluted process to get so that we can actually look at track record over here and, de- and, de- and deploy well, it over Well, a here. daft system, uh, presumably it's designed to stop blacklisting, illegal blacklisting. Um, but um, are we in, in danger of over, over-interpreting the rules, or is it a rule? No, I think it's, uh, we've tested it. We've been testing it for quite a long time, and we've finally come up with this process. Mm. It is part of the law, unfortunately. Well, uh, I shan't make the obvious point. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Given the appalling performance of concentrics, doesn't it suggest that such, a, such contracts should never have been outsourced in the first place? They should be undertaken by in-house public servants who are publicly accountable, motivated by the public service ethos, like your good self and others in the civil service. Uh, I'm a big favour of a mixed economy. Whether one particular service or not should be outsourced or not, of course, depends on a lot of things, including, by the way, the quality of the management of that service, the oversight of any contract. So I think uh, I'm not going to make a, a comment about whether this particular service should be outsourced or not. HMRC have certainly taken a decision to bring it back in-house, I'll give you some clue. Um, uh, uh, and I think, uh, you know, but that doesn't mean to say that there aren't lots of things that should be outsourced. So the answer to your question, I think, is it depends on the sort of things. But I don't well, I think yours might be the last question. Concentrics is in my constituency, and I'm concerned, you talked about uh, was it outsourcing playbook, is that what you called it? Yes. I, I would be interested to know if in this book or this guidelines which are being produced, there's something to check on the management within the company because I fully agree with what uh, Mr Jones said about the way that people using this helpline are being treated appallingly. But there's something within a company where people are actually on helplines are behaving in that way in the first place. And I would want to know if there's been pressure put upon the people who are handling the helplines to maintain their jobs in an area of high deprivation and high unemployment. Will that be in the guidelines? Um, whether or not it... I mean. In the end, the guidance is for the deployment against the big contractors. We can't, we cannot deal with all of the uh, suppliers in government. I do think this particular service happens to be a really important service, and uh, so y- y- what we're having a conversation about now is that you know we can look at the big suppliers. There might be one or two highly critical services that are done a bit. You know, this committee has also been pushing and others on. Let's use SMEs. Uh, so this is always a balance, uh, but there may be one or two specific services. This may indeed be one that is sufficiently concerning that we say, well, actually, we need to think about that in the, in the same way as we do for the big suppliers. Is it anything to say that a government contract can't be handled by a company who are not paying the living wage or, 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 or offering zero risk contracts? You have no control We that? have... Um, uh, government has mandated uh, the minimum <laughs> wage. The living wage is a different issue. Yeah. And, and we have not... At this point, um, uh, w- w- what contractors pay their employees is up to them as long as it's above the minimum wage for the moment. But it's not beyond the risk. It's not beyond possibilities that the people handling these calls are working for the minimum wage and there are severe constraints to keep their jobs. I don't know the and answer. And that could that add to their behaviour the in the first place. I don't know the answer. To that. I don't know what they were paid. Thank you very much indeed. If there's anything more you want to add, uh, to what you can't answer about that in writing, please do feel free to do so. Um, thank you. And if we need more information, we'll write to you. But thank you very much indeed for all your answers this morning. And um, thank you. My best wishes to your, all the members of your department.
Thank you very much. And um, good luck in the weeks and months ahead. <laughs> order, order. The proceeding has ended.